Okay, it's my digital socialization project. Um, I'm going to start with what messages have I received about what it means to be a white, cisgender male, able-bodied individual. Um, starting with the racial aspect, um, growing up in a small Midwestern town, I um, never really had to think about race too much until I got to college when I be really went into a more diverse um, kind of town. Um, and that was really a lot to my detriment um, as it really took me a little bit to really get the hang of multicultural discussions and being more comfortable with those discussions. I'm um, growing up in a small Midwest town. We weren't taught necessarily that, you know, to be blind to race, but it really feels like that race wasn't brought up in enough in a productive type of um, fashion. And I really think that that was something that I really didn't have to think about growing up. And I didn't realize until I got to college that that in itself is a form of privilege. Um, you know, not having to think about how your race impacts how society thinks about you. So getting to school and learning more about multiculturalism and how, um, you know, different cultures and different people are affected in the world. Um, that was really an eye-opening experience for me. Um, when it comes to the um, cisgender male component, um, again, uh, I definitely, I grew up in a house that was full. Uh, it was me and three sisters and um, that in itself, I was the only one who was really pushed to, to go to college and the chores that we were separated on um, when the chores are divided up. Um, I was always given the more boyish chores, um, you know, like cutting the grass once a week or taking out the garbage. And my sisters had to do things like clean off the table, clean up after dinner, laundry, um, you know, just things that are more typically ascribed as a uh, female chores um and they had a lot more chores than i did because um obviously um stuff that in, entails running a household um requires um you know more time and effort and uh definitely more frequency than the chores i had to do so i was aware of that type of privilege and how that impacted me in my household um but again i until I got to college, I didn't really understand how being a white male um, impacted me because I didn't have to think about that. And, um, you know, knowing what I know now, um, how, where, I, where I've come from, um, I realized that what a privilege that was in itself to, you know, to, to hear some of the stories that I've heard of, um, you know, other people, and especially what's going on right now in the, uh, you know, the social and political world with, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and the protesting that's happening. Um, I can say that if this would have been me as a kid, I wouldn't have given it much thought to where now um, I'm very concerned with what's happening and how this is impacting um, these disenfranchised groups. Um, when it comes to the able body perspective, again, um, our school was designed to have a universal, um, universal design kind of implemented to where um, you know, like we had wheelchair ramps and stuff and we had people with physical disabilities, but I really think that, you know, subconsciously, I don't want to say I looked down on those groups, but I was always very kind of hesitant to know what to do. You know, I'd want to open doors for them. I'd want to do X, Y, and Z to help them when I really never stopped to think, do they even need my help? Do they want my help? You know, and I think that also is a form of privilege to be able to just assume that somebody needs your help because you're able-bodied. Um, where I've received these messages, I really think that a lot of it comes back to my upbringing. Um, again, growing up in the small Midwestern town in Northern Indiana, um, there it was probably 95% higher, um, a white homogenous group of individuals. And again, I don't want to say that we were taught not to think about color, but color was never talked about really. And I think that really um, set me back a little bit in terms of being able to um, be introspective into my own white privilege and my own white male privilege and how that's impacted me and given me opportunities that, you know, perhaps other people would not have been given. 
Um, and I think most importantly um, is the, how do these messages influence my work as a counselor and counselor educator, because I'm not a CSAA student. Um, that's really when I had my eyes open was when I got to graduate school and, you know, began training as a counselor. Um, and I learned that, you know, because of my position as a white male, that um, it might be harder for me to be an effective counselor because I was so blind to all the privilege I had and it might be hard to connect with different people and work with different groups. Um, I really think that I struggled from the, from, especially from the beginning when, when I was like a beginning counselor years ago of not wanting to be a white, white savior complex, but definitely feeling like that because I had had so much that I could give that back to some people in some way. And I think that was very um, kind of ignorant on my part. And I'm glad that I've kind of grown past that and learned that, you know, because I come from a place of such privilege, I really have to work to understand how that privilege impacts and affects my work with clients. Um, and a big thing that we talk about in the program I'm in now is intersectionality, which is how kind of all our identities and where we've been kind of blends together. And for me, as a white male, um, you know, that's extremely salient. Part of my social identity is that, um, you know, there aren't a lot of white male counselors, or not a lot, there's not a lot of male counselors in the counseling field as a whole. And um, it's not that I'm a minority in that sense, but it definitely, um, it felt different to not be the majority in a way. Um, so that was definitely a learning experience than something that, uh, I don't want to say I wasn't ready for it, but it's definitely a little bit something that I had to get used to. Um, you know, even now, uh, I'm seeing clients as part of my um, advanced doctoral practicum. And uh, I was told today that, you know, there weren't a lot of clients on the docket right now because they had all requested female counselors. And, you know, when I had first started, that was really hard for me. When I first started my master's program, that would have been really hard for me to sit and accept. Um, but now that I've really tried to understand more about, you know, why certain people don't want to work with a male counselor, um, you know, people who've been victims of sexual abuse or, um, you know, people who um, come from a different culture than me, who really just want someone who they feel like they can relate to. Um, you know, it's important to understand for me that how my privilege has impacted how others might perceive me as well and how I have to work um, when given the chance to show that I'm actively working on engaging my own privilege and coming to terms with that so that I can be a better counselor and counselor educator. Um, and a big part of that is why I've chosen to um, go for the diversity, equity, and inclusion certificate as my cognate in the program, because I really feel like that as a white male and as someone who comes from a very homogenous area, I need to do more to, to learn more about um, not only multiculturalism and working with those other populations, but how my white identity and my white male privilege and being able body has impacted me in a way that um, means I have more work to do in order to be an effective counselor, to be able to understand what different people are talking about and, uh, you know, just really get it. And I can say that I still have a lot of work to do, but um, my, my eyes have definitely been open for a long time now about um, understanding the place of privilege that I do come from in a lot of those ways. Um, and I think that historically for me, um, that's something that I've definitely, like, even at the beginning of my undergrad, I wouldn't have considered to such a degree that I do now. And it's not something that I'm proud of, but it is definitely something that I can consider a, uh, you know, a lifelong work in progress. And, you know, I'm very blessed to have um, a very diverse um, cohort that I'm with, as well as a diverse set of professors to help mentor me in that aspect. Um, but it's definitely something that I need to continue to work on so that I can be an effective counselor educator and just be a better well-rounded person. I think that um, even when I go home now, a lot of people um, don't understand necessarily 
uh, you know, what it's like to learn about your privilege and learn about disenfranchised groups and how they might not have the same privilege as you do. I've been told countless times that, you know, everyone can, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak, which is, uh, you know, very fallacious thinking. And um, I really just think that part of me also in, in like in terms of growth is being able to be comfortable with understanding that people who do have privilege um, I'm not going to be able to change their minds. Um, I just need to work on myself and change my mind. Um, let me see what else there is here. I think that finally, um, just thinking about um, these messages that I've received, I think that it's been interesting to see that from like from my home perspective, a lot of those messages haven't changed, but the messages that I'm processing internally have changed to a great deal. And to me, I think that's a sign of progress, but I know I still have work to do. So thanks for watching.